tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more your searches through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness has found you. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 6. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and I'm thrilled you could join me tonight. Tonight's story, A Country Fried Day in the Life Peak into Hell's Middle Management, where, above all else, things are not always as they seem, comes from writer Drew Stepek, author of the much-beloved Knuckle Supper and the much-demanded Knuckle Bald, that is absolutely coming along, I promise you. And for those familiar with Knuckle Supper, you probably won't be surprised that I'm inserting a second content warning right here, that this story is particularly intense and is absolutely not intended for children. That's two content warnings. Moving on. You're listening to the standard edition of this program, if you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Now... Allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness done found you. <laughs> All right, time for a stiff drink before we begin. And I hope you like olive juice, because on the Horror Hill, the martinis can get very, very dirty. And they always burn on the way down. So put up your feet, grab a glass, and without further ado, from author Drew Stepik, I give you a little bit country. I walked into that office and wiped some dirt and sweat off of my head with my arm. The office was as wide as a laundromat, with one desk and two chairs in front of it. A fat man in glasses with a pencil behind his ear stood up and started clapping his flabby old hands. He was sweating, and his face was all red. I was sweating too, so I didn't pay it no bother. He had long hair pulled back in a ponytail, like a girl and one of them funny beards. I think people called him Van Dykes. There he is, he shouted across that room. I stopped dead in my tracks. It was the first voice I'd heard since... Uh, well, I can't even remember nothing. Uh, since I'd been there, that's for damn sure. Well, the fat man badgered me. Are you going to close the fucking door and come in? Were you born in a barn? I looked back outside the office as I gripped on that door handle. There was nothing but black behind me. I sniffed my nose and cracked my own neck. Jesus Christ, son, he hollered. We have a lot to get to. I jiggled at the handle a bit and then closed it, as I was told. Well, where am I? I asked him. Come on over here and take a seat. He pointed at one of them chairs in front of his desk. We have a lot to get through before I can send you out. I shuffled my dirty bare feet over toward him. Send me out where? I asked him. Am I going somewhere? He pointed at the chair on the left in front of his desk. You've been brought up to the big league, son. Didn't anyone brief you? He picked up his phone and pushed a flashing button. Phillips! He howled. 
What the fuck is going on? He waited a second and then rolled them bulgy eyes of his. Didn't anyone educate number? He shuffled his hands around the stacks of papers on his desk and pulled out a folder. They opened it and dragged his finger down that page. Number 25-616232285972351 huh? I got him in the office now! Look at me and he doesn't know where he is! He covered the phone with his hand. Ah, fucking processing. Heads are gonna roll, that's for sure. He pointed to that left seat again. Why don't you take a seat while I get your paperwork all situated? I'm just fine standing right here, I told him. He waved me away like a bumblebee and took his hand off of that phone. What do you mean he hasn't been processed yet? Did he at least get his orientation? He covered up the phone again and asked, Did you have your orientation yet? I didn't remember getting the orientation, so I said, I don't know. He slapped himself on the forehead. Okay, Phillips. He don't know. Ask Thompson what I should do. He pointedly pulled the phone away from his ear and pointed to it. Hold music. Oh, it's just the worst. He rocked back in that chair of his and put his arms behind his fat old head. His armpits were drenched like he just got sprayed with a garden hose. He pulled that phone back to his ear and listened. He let out a big gust of wind and pulled out that pencil from behind his ear. Started writing stuff on that folder. Okay, he said. Okay. Wait. What? He snapped the pencil in half. What do you mean I have to do it? I'm his handler. He should already be prepped and ready to go. God damn it, Phillips. He's supposed to go out today. He started beating that phone against his head. Not hard like. I think he was just making a point. Do you really expect me to believe that the processing department is short-staffed? We're in fucking hell! There are zillions of people down here! He waited a second and listened to Phillips. Oh, don't worry. The IT will hear about this. He put his hand over the phone and looked at me. Can you believe this guy? Then he pulled it right back to that face of his. Fuck me! Fuck you, Phillips! He slammed the phone back onto its butt. He put his hands over his sweaty lady haircut and started laughing like a mental patient. Oh, excuse me, mister. I tried to get his attention. What in the heck am I doing here? He peeked out behind him hands and took a deep breath. Then, he opened up that folder. Come on over here and take a seat. He pointed at that left chair. I limped on over. Seemed like I'd been walking forever and my legs hurt. Pulled that chair out from his desk. I haven't sat down in a long time, mister. He picked up some glasses and went back to the folder. Hmm. It's not like sitting is something you have to learn how to do. He looked up at me. Just joke, son. Then, he looked back down at that there folder again. Yep. Looks like you have been walking for a long time. He took him glasses off. How long do you think you've been down there? I brushed off the seat on that chair. Well, I, I don't know. It seems like forever. He smiled at me. You don't need to tell me I've been there. Thing is that there is no time in hell. It's just, um, here. I bent down to take that seat and then fell right onto my ass. That chair wasn't even there at all. He shot out of his seat and shouted, BAM! <laughs> that never gets old. You trying to hoodwink me, mister? I looked behind me to see who pulled it away before I tried to sit in it. I think no one was there. The chair weren't even there no more. He started screaming and laughing and pounding his fists on the desk. So classic. So classic! I rubbed my legs in my butt. They sure did hurt. Where'd that chair go? Why in the hell would y'all do that to me? He stopped laughing for a second and then looked behind him like I wasn't talking to him at all. Then, he turned back to me and looked at me like he didn't know whether to check his watch or scratch his ass. Y'all? He turned around again. I'm the only one here. He took a seat and then went back to that folder. Oh, here we go. He thumped on that folder with his finger. 
You're from the American South. Duh. I got back to my feet and brushed off the backs of my legs. I guess so. I don't remember much. He snapped his fingers and that chair came right back up behind me like some kind of magic trick. No one remembers much about being up there. He pointed at the white ceiling. Take your seat, please, son. I stepped up toward him. Mister, I got a mind to just sit down. I got my laugh for the day. I grabbed the chair by its arms and lowered myself onto the seat. Didn't get swallowed up into thin air this time around. He threw the folder back on the desk. Well, you don't have a name on here other than 225-616-232285972351. I was listening to him best I could, but I was thinking more about how good it felt to sit down. Seemed like I'd really been walking around to them hot old caverns forever. You're the first person I spoke to since I've been here. He looked at me like I was a squirrel on a rat trap and pointed a new pencil at me. I'm going to call you country. Started licking at my dry hands with my tongue. Why you want to call me that? He started making fun of the way I talked. Well, you're a little bit country, being a southern gentleman and all. <laughs> Besides, I don't want to have to read off that long number every time I want to call you something. Well, I think I want to go back to them caverns now, mister. I told him. He put his elbows down on the desk and looked at me straight. No, I don't think you do. My hands were covered in calluses like I got chicken pox from a baseball mitt. I tried to look at him best I could. And, um, why is that? Jesus! He yelled, and then pushed me some lotion on the corner of his desk. Licking your hands is only going to make them worse. I squirted a little bit of the lotion out of the jar and then smelled it. This ain't hot sauce or nothing, is it? Hot sauce? Ha <laughs> ha! Hilarious! He grabbed the bottle and dealt a little bit onto his hands and then lathered them up. That is a good idea, though. I need to remember that one. He stood up. You want something to drink, country? <laughs> Better not be no hot sauce. I warned him. He walked over to a water cooler in the corner that wasn't there a second before. What exactly is your obsession with hot sauce? He poured out some water into a little cup and brought it back to me. I grabbed the cup and sucked it down. Couldn't even remember the last time that I had water. I handed it back to him. Can I have me a little more? He chuckled. You bet, country. He walked back to the water cooler and refilled that cup. You know... You're real lucky. In all my time working as a handler down here, I've never seen anyone make it to agent status so quickly. The IT must have seen something special in you. The IT? I asked. Yeah, the IT. Trust me. He moseyed back to me with my second cup of water. I'm just a lowly handler, and I had to suck the IT's dick and eat the IT's pussy for what seemed like forever. You ain't making no sense. I took the cup and licked at the rim like a bullfrog catching a fly before I drank it down. It was the best darn water I ever did have. The IT is what people up there call the devil, he giggled. Satan? Lord of the Underworld? Mephistopheles? Let me get this straight, mister. The devil is some kind of lady? Didn't you just hear me say that it had a dick, country? Keep up. You ever heard of a lady with a dick? I crunched up the paper cup over my head and tried my damnedest to squeeze every darn drop of water out of it. You also said that the IT had a vagina. The IT has both. They started yapping. I don't know what the fuck I was sucking and eating. You don't ask the IT questions. The bottom line is that I did my time and I got this job. Now, as of today, I work for you. Well, I never heard about nothing like that about dicks and vaginas and all. I also never even met this IT thing. I unfolded the cup and put it down on his desk. I wanted more water, but I didn't want to seem like I was giving him no disrespect. What are we going to be doing? Shoveling pig shit or something? 
He sat down behind his desk and started giggling. Oh no, country. Oh, we won't be shoveling pig shit. He pulled open a drawer behind that desk of his and then dropped a bunch of books and folders in front of me. As of today, you are an agent. You will be sent out into the field to manipulate the forces of heaven. Your purpose, well, our purpose, is to break down the followers of God, one at a time. Do what now? I picked up one of them books and flipped through the pages. He smirked and put out his hand to shake mine. Name's Sonny Hooper. You can call me Hoop. I will be your coach and your handler. I looked up from that book, licked my hand, and shook his. You do know how to read, don't you? He asked me. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by Best Fiends. When you finish binging the latest riveting podcast on your list, there's always one lingering question staring you in the face. Now what? Well, normally, I'll turn the lights down, take a relatively comfortable chair, but not one that I'll fall asleep in, scooch it over towards the nearest window, and just stare out of it. The only company being that merciless silence. Thinking about all the things that I could have done differently in my life. It just feels like a big joke sometimes. And it's in these dark nights of the soul that I like to take out my phone and clear a few levels in Best Fiends. And to be honest, sometimes I just play it when I'm feeling good. It's a fun game. I get a little obsessed with it sometimes. And that sweet rush of adrenaline when you beat a level, the increasingly challenging puzzles, it just really helps me de-stress. Like after having a bad day at work, or floundering in an existential desert, dancing to the tedious elevator music of my own thoughts, tormented by my own obscene insignificance in an ever-expanding universe. Best Fiends always reminds me that the absurdity of the human condition can still be pretty darn fun. With over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play, with more levels, events, and challenges added all the time. So play away, because there's always more where that came from. In fact, you might find yourself wondering how you ever found time for a dull moment before. And when boredom looks up from the filth and shouts, save me, best fiends will whisper, no. With all the adorable and endearing characters, the immersive and expanding puzzle design, and that sexy sizzle of accomplishment every time you reach a new level. Well, it's time to play the game. So what are you waiting for? Break the shackles of empty existence in an uncaring world and download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Seriously, guys, it's a good game. I play it while I'm on the elliptical. Super fun. You should definitely give it a shot. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. I assume you slept well? Mr. Hooper asked me. He walked over and handed me a big old bottle of water. I pulled some crust off the inside of my nose and sucked that water down. It refilled by itself. Well, I'll be. I figured it was some kind of magic or something. It sure was nice to sleep in a bed, but that fan wasn't really working real well. Country! He dug them flabby hands of his into a bag of potato chips. You're in hell! Do you know how hard it is to get fans down here at all? He waved me over to a new door that appeared behind his desk, over by that water cooler. I followed him. I remember one summer, all them hardware stores in my town were out of fans. That must have been like hell! <laughs> <clears throat> it's said in your file that you're from Tupelo, Mississippi, the home of the king. Like he just turned on a light bulb in a closet, I remembered the king. I remembered Elvis. I like music. 
He put out his hand and let me enter that new room before him. I looked inside. It was all white with some kind of computer doohickey and some other type of trough that looked to be hooked up to the computer doohickey. There ain't no tricks in here, is there? Along with that chair? He put up his arms and the flab jiggled in the short sleeved shirt. We don't have time for tricks, country. I walked into that room. He pointed to the computer doohickey. That is the machine that will take you back to the Earth realm. I scuffled over to the trough and bent down to smell it. It wasn't a trough like the tin ones I used to fill on my daddy's farm. At least, I didn't think so. I'm getting out. I looked at them hands of mine. I get to leave? He put his hand over his face. Oh God, no! You just get to go on a vacation. He walked over to that computer doohickey and pushed a couple of buttons on a typewriter that lit up like a light bright toy. Did you read any of the books or assignments that I gave you yesterday? I walked over to him and looked at the window glass TV screen on top of that computer doohickey. It was too dark to read. I touched that window screen. He swatted my hand away like I was a fly on a hot dog. Don't touch that country! Are you telling me that you don't know how this works? I was getting a little tired of his tone. I said it was dark. He smacked himself on the head. Fuck! That's right. You can't read! I can read! I yelled at him. Uh, I think. Look, it's not that hard. I have sent several agents into the field without understanding the ins and outs of the equipment. He handed me a little June bug looking thing. Put this over your ear. I turned that critter over and hundreds of thousands of legs jiggled round. I didn't much like that bug. It's not going to bite me, is it? Bite you? No! It's an earpiece! So I can communicate with you! He pointed out a microphone coming out of that light bright typewriter in front of the computer doohickey. I talk into that and you hear me in your ear. I will be watching you from this. He pointed at the window glass TV. That way, I can monitor what you are doing. We can't have you breaking any of the treaty agreements with the guys upstairs. He pointed at that ceiling. I put the bug in my ear. It clamped over the top and the bottom. I felt all thousands of them legs prick into my skin. You mean God? God, Jesus, angels and shit. The other team. Let me make this simple. He pointed to that white trough. You will be in here. Then he walked over to that computer doohickey. I will be watching you from here. You will be doing what I say and playing for our team. It's like football. I like football. I think. I scratched at my ear. The June bug was locked on there pretty tight. It was making me want to sneeze for some reason. What position am I playing? It's not literally football. Mm. You will be taking over the body of a little girl who is presumed possessed. The device in your ear will control your crossing between the realms. He tapped on that June bug thing. I looked at the window glass TV on top of that computer doohickey. It was seeing everything that I was seeing. I waved my hand in front of my face. Huh. This machine. He waved his hand around the room. It's connected to Hell's Core. It allows us to communicate with the Earth Realm through little girls. I didn't much understand what he was saying, so I just acted like I did and nodded my head. Well, little girls. They are the easiest to occupy. For some reason, everyone thinks that when a little girl is sad or starting her period that she is possessed. So, we breach their consciousness when they are easily inhabitable. I could tell you a million stories of all the times that the other team has tried to shut down our operation because we figured that out. That's why there is a treaty in place. We can scare the hell out of anyone we want, but we can't kill anyone from their team. It's become a game of influence. We used to be able to take down whoever we wanted, but uh, the IT has kind of a weird relationship with the other team. Remember that. Our job is to outwit them 
and show the rest of the Earth realm the persuasion of the IT. I looked at Mr. Hooper and then at the TV screen. Remember what? Jesus country! He put one of them hands of his on the microphone and pushed a couple buttons on that light bright typewriter. Phillips! He turned around to look at me and said, Just a second. He turned back to that computer doohickey. I saw the back of his head in that glass window TV. This guy isn't ready. He put his hand over that June bug in his ear. I know that we're short-staffed, asshole. I think we should send him back to the caverns. He doesn't even want to do this. I walked over and tapped him on the shoulder. Mr. Hooper. Hoop. Call me Hoop. He shushed me like we was in a church. Not you, Phillips. I know you know my name. He's talking to me. The dune bug in my ear started to itch some more. Hooper, I don't want to go back to them caverns. What do I gotta do? He put up his finger again. Wait, Phillips. It looks like he doesn't want to go back to the caverns. I shook my head and talked into my dune bug. I don't want to go back to them caverns, Mr. Phillips. You heard it from him. Can we send him up to show you that he's ready? Yes. Okay, of course, I'll get him to sign the paperwork. Mr. Hooper stuck up his thumb. I think we're in business. He walked over to the trough and flipped some doodad. Oh, fuck you, Phillips. He smirked and winked at me. You have a better chance of going back to the caverns than my boy country. He waited a second. Oh, yeah. You want to make a wager? <laughs> You're on. He waited another second. Toolshed? Are you fucking kidding me? She's in a fucking toolshed? This hick will be a rock star in a toolshed. If country fucks this up, I'll do a thousand years in the caverns. If he does things right... You go back to the caverns. Later, dipshit. He put his hand over his June bug like he was hanging up a telephone. D do I gotta go back? I took another drink from the water. Sure did taste good. Mr. Hooper grabbed a stack of papers that was sitting next to the computer doohickey. He handed it to me. You have to sign this now. I looked at the pages but couldn't read nothing. Well, what does it say? That... <clears throat> That's right. You can't read. He grabbed them papers back. I can read. I... I think. He pointed to the first page. This says that you're enlisted in the service of the underworld and that you pledge yourself to the IT. He went to the next page. This says that you will abide by the rules of the treaty, blah, blah, blah. Remember, don't kill any priests, parents, good Christians, people, etc. We don't kill. Our mission is to influence. He flipped through more of them pages. This is the treaty. He flipped through what seemed like a couple of hundred pages and finally he got to that final page. This says that you are choosing not to walk the cabins anymore. And finally, this says that you won't try to escape once you're in the Earth realm. Escape? Yeah, man. If you rip this off, he rubbed on the June bug in my ear. When you're in the Earth realm, you're trapped there. I took a sip of that water. So, I'd be free. No. <laughs> you're not going there yourself. Only a soul. Hmm, your brain's going there too. You will be trapped in the body of one of your hosts. Sure, you'll feel all the same pain that your host feels and you'll be able to smell the air and taste the food and all that good shit. But you won't be there. Imagine being in a jail where you can't talk to anyone you see. That sure does sound better than them caverns, I told him. Of course it does. He flicked his fat old finger on that page. Once you sign this, you'll never see the cabins again. I promise. You will be able to drink all the water you want. You will have a bed and a room every night. If you help me win this bet, shit, I'll get you a working fan and some lights in your room. He handed me back them papers and a pen. Please help me out, country. 
In case you didn't hear, I just made a bet with that pederast Phillips. Man! Do I hate that guy? He's been trying to steal my job for years. I looked at them papers and grabbed that pen. So, my brain won't hear anymore? He turned back to the computer doohickey. No, your little brain won't be in hell anymore. I don't much like the way you're talking to me again, Mr. Hooper. Fine, he said as he punched away on that light bright typewriter. Big brain, you have a fucking big brain. I started to sign in papers and then stopped. Wait, what's my name? He didn't turn around. Just sign the contract country. If it can't spell, then just put an X. I'll send it over to Phillips immediately and he'll process 225-616-2328597235199. I scratch an X on that last page. Mr. Hooper snatched them papers back from me and fed them into his computer doohickey. This should do the trick. Thing is that you need to follow the rules when you're up there because we're sending you out as an unprocessed agent. We are taking a chance on you because I believe in you. He waited a minute. I took a gulp of water. Did you get the contract, Phillips? He snapped his fingers at me and pointed toward the trough. Then, he whispered to me, Get in. I walked over to that trough. It opened up like a garage door and I looked inside. There was all types of machines and wires inside of it. But there was also a comfortable looking lawn chair in the middle. I pushed my hands up against the back. Sure was soft. Oh, fuck off, Phillips! Mr. Hooper screamed like an alley cat. Be sure and tell the old gang down in the cabins I fucking hate them! He tapped on his dune bug again and then hit a few more times on that light bright typewriter. I dragged my legs over the side of the trough and laid back in the chair. Is this right? Perfect country, now lay back! He walked up behind me and put this thingy that looked like a green bean strainer over my head. It's going to be a bit disorienting when you slip back to the earth realm, but it will get easier the more you do it. He flipped on a switch on the side of that green bean strainer. Are you my boy? I ain't nobody's boy, I told him. He laughed and his fat rolls jiggled near my nose. I know that. You're a badass. You're a soldier. You're a hero. He slapped me on my arm. Tell me the rules now. I stretched out my neck. That chair sure was comfortable. I felt like a pig in shit. Sure it was better than walking around them caverns. Number one, don't tear off this or my brain will be inside a little girl forever. I tapped on that dune bug. He started wheezing away. Perfect. What else? Don't kill no priest or nothing like that. Don't kill anyone, country. Remember the treaty. You have to remember the treaty. If you fuck this up, the IT will get in trouble with God, and then I will be sucking dicks and eating pussies for a long time. Don't kill nobody, I said. Red light started swirling around on top of that window glass TV, and a bunch of gravy started filling up inside the trough. Mr. Hooper counted down with them fingers of his. Three, two, one. Good luck, country. Let's send Phillips back to the cabins where he belongs. Goddamn Yankee, I think he lived in Boston when he was on Earth. I don't think I've ever been to no Boston, but I don't think I'd like it. The top of that trough locked tight like a cigarette holder, and the gravy completely filled it up. Didn't smother me though, and it didn't taste like no gravy I ever had before. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by BetterHelp. Ah, another Halloween come and gone. The cheapest, most enjoyable, and above all, least stressful of the holidays. It will be missed. But we have the other ones to look forward to, and everything that comes with them. Like jet lag, overeating, credit card debt, food poisoning, passive aggression, 
New socks. That one libertarian uncle. The other libertarian uncle. Gluten intolerance. Christmas music. The highly elusive though equally irksome Thanksgiving music. More socks. I tell you, it's enough to make a man sick. But don't worry, no matter where you end up this holiday, better hell is never far away. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Like the aforementioned pre and post holiday depression anxiety cycle? But whatever the issue, BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, with whom you can start communicating in under 48 hours. BetterHelp is not a crisis line, and it's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. There is a broad range of expertise available which may not be locally available in many areas, and BetterHelp services clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room again. Which certainly has its advantages these days. I won't say why, but you can probably guess. And BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit BetterHelp.com slash hill. That's Better H-E-L-P. And join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. And don't forget about that special offer for Horror Hill listeners to get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash hill. One more time, that's Better H-E-L-P dot com slash hill. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. I opened my eyes and spit out that gravy taste, but nothing came out. The vacation ride made my big old brain feel drunker than Cooter Brown, whoever the hell that was. I looked around to see where I was. I was in a tool shed, hitting back in a corner behind a lawnmower. I scratched at it to see if it was real and got my hand all tangled up in some spider webs. Yep, it was real all right. I put my hand up my dress. There weren't no man parts down there. I was inside of one of them little girls. I didn't want to go up in there too far. Didn't much like messing around with little girls, I reckon. The door across the shed opened and I think I heard a bird chirping. Little old mouse scurried into another corner. Violet? Are you in here? The man hollered into the shed. It's just Deacon Brashears, Deacon Prine, and your pa. I peeked up over the side of the mower, and the barn doors into the shed opened about halfway. I was back. I was back on Earth. I heard a voice in that dune bug on my ear. Country, can you hear me? I looked out and saw them deacons enter the shed. Country, it's Hoop, can you hear me? I pressed on the dune bug like Mr. Hooper said. I hear you, I said. At least I think I said my voice sounded like a little girl. This is weird. Don't worry, the machine in your ear is cloaked when you're in the earth realm. You successfully crossed the plains. What do you see? The deacon started to enter the shed. Violet? It's your paw? We're here to help you. I pressed on that dune bug again and whispered like a cotton-tailed rabbit. I'm in the shed. Some men are coming in here. Uh think they want to help me? What should I do? Mr. Hooper laughed. <laughs> Flick the switch on the side of the receiver on your ear. I need to see what's happening. I need to handle the situation. Remember, no fuck-ups or I'm in the cabins for a long-ass time. 
I turned on the little switch on the side of that dune bug like Mr. Hooper told me. I felt a breeze come from outside through a hole in the shed. It smelled nice, like the magnolias were blooming on a spring day. It smelled better than that burnt pig shit in them caverns. It smelled like home. It made me remember home. I even think I heard a bird chirping outside. Good work. I can see the door and the men. Keep looking in that direction. I need to know what we're dealing with. Remember, no killing. I did as Mr. Hooper told me. Three shadows entered the shed. I grabbed onto the seat of the mower. Oh shit. What, Mr. Hooper, what do you see? I asked him. Open your eyes. Cold red country, they have bats and a shotgun. He was right. As soon as them deacons and that paw got to the middle of the shed, one of them clicked on a light bulb with a string. Two was all choking up on different bats, and the man who wasn't in a church outfit had a shotgun. I think that one was paw. Why do they have bats and guns, Mr. Hooper? I asked him, getting a little chilly from the hole in the shed. Jesus, country. They know that you're inside the little girl. Fucking Phillips blew our cover. We should abort. Abort? You should come back. They've already won. Looks like it's back to the caverns for me. Damn it. I ain't going back to no caverns, I yelled out. Violet? One of them men asked. We're here to help you. Come on out of that corner. Abort, country. Abort! I stood up and brushed off that spring dress that little girl had on. I tapped on the June bug. I ain't going back to them caverns. Violet, baby? It's Paul. What caverns, honey? One of them men said to me. I looked over next to me and grabbed a digging spade. You all better not come back here. I'll fucking kill you motherfuckers. I'll rip them dicks of yours and eat them like a possum pie. They all gasped as if they'd never heard a swear before. Country, God damn it! stand down! Fuck you, Mr. Hooper. I'm going to win this football game, I told him. You ain't got to worry about sucking no more dicks or eating no more vaginas. I jumped on top of that lawnmower seat and pulled that spade back behind my right ear. Little girl's hair fell in front of my face. Get out of here, you fucking Yankees. Go back to heaven. Daniel, go back in the house. You don't need to see this. The pa stood there crying like a woman. His shotgun fell onto the dirt floor. One of them deacons stepped to me. Violet, put down that shovel. The June bug started blaring static and buzzing in my ear, but I couldn't really hear nothing Mr. Hooper was saying to me. I turned off that switch that he had me turn on. I'm gonna kill you fuckers. I jumped at the deacon in front and shoved the spade right around his dick. He dropped to his knees and started begging me to stop. I shoved that thing in and out his gullet like I was churning butter. A lot of his insides dumped onto the ground in front of him. He fell on his knees like he was starting to pray. They weren't praying though. He was trying to pick up his gizzards and all and put it back inside of him. I started sawing through all them guts like I was jumping through sprinklers in the mud. I picked up a long string of him insides and wrapped it around his neck like I was putting Christmas lights on a tree. He coughed and screamed and it smelled kind of like he might have shit in his drawers. He started losing his breath and finally fell forward. I lifted up that spade and dug it clean through him from the other side. When he hit the ground flat and stopped flipping and flopping, I just dug my little girl hands into them ears of his and pulled his head off. That second deacon came at me with his bat and swung away, merely missing my head. Stupid Yankee. I walked on top of that one who was dead and shoved my little girl fingers into his eyes. You don't fuck with my team! I ripped around in his sockets and scratched his face, tearing all the skin right off. Water pouring out of his eyes tickled on my fingers and made me smile. I wasn't in no cavern no more. Pa folded like a coward at a card table in the corner, squealing like a little baby hog. All he could say was, no, Violet, please stop. The second deacon came with me again. He didn't really have much of a face no more. Lord, give me power! 
he cried. I jumped off with the deacon whose head I ripped off on the floor of the shed. That one without a face was humming songs about God and looking at me like he wanted to kill. I ran back over to the mower and I climbed up on the workbench. I snatched up two hammers that were sitting next to my dirty little girl feet. The deacon charged at me. Satan, leave this innocent child, he growled. I growled at him, and he swung that bat of his and missed me again because I jumped like a bullfrog. It was about then that it became clear that I had some type of superhero powers. I threw myself at him and grabbed onto that neck of his, dragging him down to the dirt floor. Please, God, give me the power to fight the evils of... He didn't say another word on account of me smashing his mouth with the front of one of them hammers. I started laughing again as them teeth of his started jumping around like popcorn on a hot stove. I got up and danced around him doing the do si -do while he tried to grab that bat of his again. I took that other hammer and started using the claw side to hack away at his throat. He was choking and it sounded kind of like he was gurgling with baking soda. I smacked that hammer into the bottom of that chin of his and then danced back round behind his head and ripped that jaw of his clean off his head. I heard Pa still crying. If he knew what was good for him, he'd just count the seconds of life that he had left and enjoy the show. I was done with the second deacon. I dug both of them hammers into both sides of his forehead. I wasn't counting, but I must have smashed into that skull of his ten times. He tried to shake his head, but he just dragged them claws further and further into his skull. He picked up his jaw and his teeth and junk, and then he tried his darndest to speak. I grabbed onto that tongue of his that was dangling like a dick on sex night, stepped on what was left of his throat, pulled it right out. I threw it over at Paul, letting him know that he was next. More static came through on the June bug. Country, God damn it! abort! Do not engage! Turn your camera back on! I ain't going back to them caverns, Mr. Hooper. That second Yankee deacon started to sputter out like a truck ran out of gas, so I stood up over him and started running piss out of my new girl parts all over that chest of his. Fuck you, deacon. There ain't no God to help you now. You go and tell that to Mr. Phillips. I never did lack no cheaters. He weren't talking no more, so instead of going on about the devil and whatnot, I pulled them hammers out of his head. The second hammer was buried pretty deep, but I jimmied it loose. I looked Pa straight in the face as I smashed both claws down next between them eyes of his. With all my little girl's superhero power might, I cracked that head of his open like the Grand Canyon. His eyes busted out of them sockets and landed next to that pile of teeth and that jaw of his. The hammers flew out of my hands to both sides of that shed, and it dug my face into the bowl I made out of his head. I had tasted varmint brain before, but I never did try human brain until that day. I hadn't eaten nothing all those years in the caverns, and it weren't as good as I remember steak being, but it were delicious on that day. Country, what the fuck is going on up there? I can't lock your location. I need to bring you back now. You don't want to be trapped up there. I sniffed around like a coon hound to let Pa know that I was hunting. He was curled up in the corner with that shotgun his across his lap. Why are you crying, Pa? I asked him and wiped some of them brains off my face. All sorts of goo and muck dripped down the front of that dress of mine. The head of that first deacon was between us. I picked it up by the hair and rolled it like a bowling ball over to Pa. Please, Violet, he whimpered and tried to hide behind them hands of his. Please, Lord, please. Save my Violet. More static came through that June bug, but I couldn't hear no more Mr. Hooper. I stubbed my toe into one of them circular saw tables on my way to go play with Pa, and a blade fell near a little girl foot of mine. Pa put his hands together like he was praying. Please, God, please, God, please dispel this demon from my sweet Violet. 
I bent over in that little girl dress and picked up that saw blade. One of them edges cut into my finger. I licked my little girl blood and spit it at Pa. He was still crying. It made me laugh. Country turned your camera back on. Before I knew it, I was standing over Pa. He stopped praying and looked up at me. Violet, it's Pa. Please come back to me. I raised up that saw blade and buried it into that spot between the little girl's devil finger and ring finger. Mr. Hooper was right. It felt worse than getting that hand of her stuck in a wood chipper. I pressed it down as far as it would go, cracking and breaking bones in that top of that little girl hand. Then, when I finally buried it all the way down to my little wrist, I bent them little legs and started shitting on Pa's coveralls. Pa stopped crying and I grabbed his hand. Tell that Yankee Phillips that the South will rise again. I pulled Pa's arm out and right as he started shrieking, I used my new saw hand to chop off that arm of his. I kept shitting as I stood on top of him. He laid down, taking in his own dirty defeat. Then... I just beat his face in with his own arm. That wasn't killing him, so I took to the saw hand. I just started pulling him apart like a dog with a rag doll. Arms, then legs, then dick, then balls. He was choking on vomit and blood and whatever else, so I helped him out and shoved his fingers from the dead arm into his mouth. Still laughing and shitting, I kind of just started cutting holes in his face. After I got tired of that, I totally sawed his head right down the dead center. There was blood going everywhere in the shed like someone had shot a BB gun into the side of a swimming pool. I dug into his brain and ate away. My second non-verbin brain was better than the first one. Tasted every bit as good as a squirrel, I think. More static came through on that June bug. I've got you. You're coming back, country, you stupid fucking redneck. I opened my real eyes and the white trough started draining water like a bathtub. The cigarette case lid opened up just like it closed. Mr. Hooper ran over and smacked the side of the trough. What in the fuck did you do? I shook the vacation sweating out of my head and grabbed onto the side of that trough. <laughs> Maybe I'm a little bit... More rock and roll than you was thinking. He threw them hands of his up and down like he was waving down a fire in barn. What the fuck does that mean? I pulled my body up from the lawn chair and threw my leg over the side of the trough. Well, you said that I was a little bit country, and I said I was a little bit rock and roll. Is that a joke? Is that a fucking joke? He cursed. How do you even fucking remember that? I don't know, I told him. I was just playing the sport like you told me to. He stomped over to that light bright typewriter and punched a few of them keys. Jesus country, I told you not to kill anyone. What in the fuck was that? Are you so fucking stupid that you took the sports reference literally? He tapped on that June bug in his ear. He waited a bit. He pushed some more buttons, then he looked back at me. You killed two of God's servants. An innocent man. The girl is dead for sure. You shoved a fucking saw blade straight through her hand, down to her wrist. It's too late to send to the cleanup crew. That tool shed is swarming with angels. They was trying to get me, I told him. They threw a big bunch of papers across the room at me. You know that this means I have to go back down to the caverns, right? Looks like it's a thousand years of me sucking the IT's dick and pussy again. Fuck. I didn't mean to get you in no trouble. His face went white like he just saw General Lee's ghost. He lifted that fat old finger of his and put it to his lips. He wanted me to shut up. I grabbed at the water bottle. It was full again. He tapped at the June bug on his ear. Hello, Phillips. I wasn't up there for very long, but I knew that breeze sure felt good. I tickled that June bug in my ear on the belly. 
The arms pumped in and out like a water pump at well. Maybe that June bug didn't have to stay on my ear after all. Mr. Hooper fell back in that seat of his and laid back on it like it was a rocking chair on a porch. His belly stuck out and popped one of them buttons on that shirt of his. He didn't even know. Yes, Phillips, I am quite aware of what happened. He let out a big gasp and listened to his June bug. I drank some more water. Yes, Phillips, I get it. Well, it was your job to process him. I'm just supposed to handle him. I flipped on that switch on the side of my June bug and looked at Mr. Hooper and then at the glass TV on top of that desk of his. It was a TV camera, I reckoned. Of course, I know that I am the one who took the bet. He started yammering on again. I know he wasn't ready, you scumbag. You took advantage of me, Phillips. Phillips? Phillips? And then I saw him tickle the belly on that June bug in his ear and flip the switch up and down three times. The bug's legs came off from round his ear and he threw it across the room. I was right. It did come off. I started walking over to where he threw it to get it from him. When I started bending over, he started screaming. You fucking idiot! Don't bother with that! I won't need that where I'm going. When I touched his June bug, it crawled away, so I didn't bother with it no more. Where are you going? Don't we have more games to play? Unfortunately for me, I'm going back to the cabins for Lord only knows how long. He started crying. Phillips is going to be your new handler. Mr. Hooper, I didn't mean no harm, I told him. I was just doing what felt right. He walked over to me and put his hand on my shoulder. I get it, country. You didn't know. It was my mistake. I should never have explained the job to you the way I did. More so, I should never have sent you on a mission without any training. Then, out of nowhere... A bunch of red sirens started flashing all around the room. They weren't there before, I don't think. What the hell now? Mr. Hooper yelled as he wiped all them tears off his fat face. He started running after the June bug, but it was too fast for him. Help me, country! I need to get this! I ran over by him and chased the June bug across the floor up and down the walls until we finally cornered it by the trough. Don't break it, country! I need it! I put my hands down and cupped them together. The June bug, with all his hundreds of legs, crawled right into my fingers like a cradle. I slowly got up and put out my hands. I suppose it was the least I could do for poor old Mr. Hooper. He plucked that little fella up by a few of its legs and put it over his ear. He tapped on the side. Phillips, what now? Code red, 559er? Not possible. He walked back to that light bright typewriter and pushed a few buttons. Some stuff happened on that window glass TV. Not gonna happen, Phillips. He turned a dial on the side of the desk. I understand that we're short staffed. He. He just killed four people! There is no way I'm going to send him up again! He put those hands of his and pushed them downward. <sighs> I'll ask him. I took a drink of that water bottle. What's all these lights mean, Mr. Hooper? He tapped the new bug. We have a situation. A big situation. A code red 559er to be exact. I, I don't know what all that means, I confessed. It means that God and his team, I mean associates, are about to take down one of our most precious hosts. They are apparently angry about what happened earlier. You mean with me? Yes, country. With you. Well, I asked him. What can we do? Phillips wants to send you back into this host to fight off God's associates. I told him I'd ask you. I tickled that June bug on my ear. It was my chance. If Mr. Hooper was going back to the caverns, and so was I... I sure didn't have a whole lot of interest in sucking no IT's dick. I'll do it. I swear I won't kill nobody this time. He let out a giant gasp of air. Maybe we don't have to go back to the caverns. Get in the pod and prepare for transfer. 
He meant the trough. Well, I did as I was told. He tapped on his June bug. Phillips, we'll do it. You have to promise me, though, that if we do succeed in protecting the asset, that you will stand up for me. Mr. Hooper snapped his finger at the trough and then started tapping away at the light bright typewriter. Get in, he told me. Thank you, Phillips, he said. I know we haven't fixed the situation yet, but thank you. He tapped on his June bug and walked over next to me. They are going to let us do it, country. Sweet Jesus. Sweet Jesus, I said too. He bent down about the same time that lawn chair started dropping into that trough. The gravy started coming up around me again. What are the rules, country? Please listen to me this time. No killing no one. And? He tapped on my June bug. And don't take this off or turn her off. He put up his hand like he was saluting me. Thank you for serving the IT, soldier. I saluted him back. Figured it was the right thing to do. The cigarette case lid started to fold over me and the gravy filled up the trough. There was no way that I was going back to them caverns ever again. I opened my eyes. I was in bed. I reached down between my legs like I had before. There was no man parts there, but there sure was blood all over that little girl's legs. I looked at my fingers. They were little girl fingers. There was a song playing on a record player in the room. I recognized it. That song was called A Little Bit Country, A Little Bit Rock and Roll. I always liked that song. I think that was my favorite song. Dirty old fan was blowing cold air at me from a nightstand. I heard crickets chirping outside the window. I tapped on the June bug. Mr. Hooper, can you hear me? Yes, now turn on the camera. I got up out of that bed and looked out the window. I saw a nice farm outside and a rusty old swing set. I knew that swing set. Was it mine? I took a sip of a glass of water next to that fan. Two hound dogs ran by chasing a squirrel. All them years in the cavern made me forget how much I loved being alive. I wanted to be alive again. I don't think that I'm going to turn on that camera, Mr. Hooper. I whispered. What are you talking about, country? Turn on the camera. We have to protect the asset. We had a deal. I started rubbing on the June bug just like Mr. Hooper had before. No, we didn't have no deal. You had a deal with Mr. Phillips in that IT. God damn you, country. You can't do this to me. You signed a contract. That's where you're wrong. I never saw nothing and nothing has been processed. You said it yourself. I clicked the switch on the June bug up and down three times and it started coming loose from my ear. I want to be alive again, Mr. Hooper. I don't ever want to go back to them caverns. Don't do this, country. You can't do this to me. The June bug jumped off of my ear onto the floor and I didn't hear nothing in my ear no more. I were a free man. Free to be back on the earth, listening to my favorite song and feeling the breeze from a hot summer night. I got out of the bed and started stomping away at the June bug with my bare foot to the beat of that song by Donnie and Marie that I remembered loving so much. It clicked and fizzed and sparked. Finally, it was all out of juice. I walked across my new room and picked up a little rag doll. I took it back to bed with me. It wasn't as good as feeling a woman next to me in bed, but it was better than hell. It was better than them caverns. And it was better than taking orders from fat old Mr. Hooper. Just before I started to fall asleep in my new life, my great new life, the door to the bedroom creaked open a little bit and light shined in from the hall. A man came into the room and made his way over to that new bed next to me. He sat down. It was me. Recognize yourself, Deacon Fuch? I started blinking and huffing. I tried talking back to Mr. Hooper's voice in my head, but no words were coming out of that little girl's mouth. 
How, how can you talk to me? I asked in my mind. Oh, come on, Johnny. Do you really think that hell is in the business of giving people promotions and sending them to Earth for vacations? Ha! I, I don't understand, sir. Please bring me back now. I kept yelling, but nothing was coming out. The man, me, started running his wet hands through that little girl's hair of mine with one of his bare hands, and then he started rubbing up inside my bloody girl parts. There is no back. There are no agents. There are no handlers. There is no Phillips. Our job is to punish people for their sins. It is hell, after all. <laughs> then, it all came back to me as quick as Mama Bird bringing food back to her nest. I was Deacon Johnny Fuch. I had my way with the little girls in my flock. I raped them. I beat them. I told them that I could rid their bodies of the devil's evil. The little girl I was in... I killed her. Her mom and pa told me that she had the devil in her on account as she was bleeding out of her body and carrying on. I buried her little body under that swing set outside of that window. I can't really say it was a pleasure getting to know you. And then... Just as my head went quiet again, the other me pushed my little girl head into that pillow on the bed. The little girl tried to scream. I tried to scream. Nobody heard nothing. The belt unbuckled for the first time in what would be a zillion more. Forever. I felt my own penis go inside that little girl as those wet, Bloody hands wrapped around that little girl's throat. Welcome to your eternity, Deacon Fuch. You've been listening to A Little Bit Country by Drew Stepek. I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Horror Hill. Don't forget to tune in again next week when I yet again regale you with a handful of tales to terrify, plumbed from the most depraved depths of the human imagination. A Little Bit Country was brought to you courtesy of and written by Drew Stepek. For more than 20 years, Drew Stepek has written, produced, and directed for the publishing, online, and entertainment industries. Drew has worked for Film Threat, Sci-Fi Universe, Wild Cartoon Kingdom, The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, Late Night with Conan O'Brien, Saturday Night Live, The Profiler, The Pretender, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and ESPN. In the past 10 years, the author ventured into creative directing and ideation roles involving entertainment and technology marketing for Davy Brown Entertainment and Straight Up Technologies. In 2012, Stepek took a position as the head of branded entertainment for Machinima. He has also been a creative director at Awesomeness TV. Born in Royal Oak, Michigan, Drew moved around a bit as a young man and finally found his home base in Hollywood, California in 1994. Drew attended Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida. His first novel, Godless, was released 666, that's June 6th, 2006, and has since captured a strong underground following. Currently, Stepik is working on the sequels to his novels Knuckle Supper and Knuckle Bald. An audiobook edition of Knuckle Supper, featuring yours truly, Jason Hill, is available now as well on audible.com. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. 
If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive, dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thanks so much for your time, and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you help support this show. And that means a lot to me. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listeners, when we meet up once again atop the horror hill for yet another dance with darkness, I bid you good night, sleep tight, listener, and whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. (laughs) Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Felipe Ojeda, Luke Hodgkinson, and Jesse Cornett. Final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshak. The program's artwork by yours truly, Jason Hill. Logo by Craig Groshak. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, Do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. (laughs) 